It is a joy to be here, and I don't take this for granted at all. Um, I think the Lord has just blessed me in so many ways, and this is just a blessing to me to be able to be with you and to be able to bring to you just a little tidbit of what the Lord has for us today. As we get into this workshop, I want to start by, I want to say, I want to stop, and I want us to pray. Although I'm very passionate about this workshop that I'm teaching you, I want us to pray for the men. My husband is getting ready to teach a very serious workshop. And I've bathed this man in prayer for a whole year for this workshop. And Satan can ruin this in a heartbeat. And I want us to pray for our husbands at this moment. Our Father, I do pray that you will bathe my husband in your blood. And I pray that the men will have open hearts and that they will have a an amazing result from this message that my husband brings. I pray that as wives, we will be to our husbands exactly what they need. And I pray that we can follow your pattern for our lives and for our marriages. Speak through me today in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, Cock a doodle do. <laughs> As Barney said last night, I hope you took time to soothe the savage in your man last night. <laughs> wow. You know, I heard that as a result of these couples' retreats, that nine out of ten husbands now agree that their wives are always right. <laughs> now, the tenth one has mysteriously disappeared, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm calling this workshop the S-word. <laughs> not that S-word. <laughs> I'm not talking about S-E-X, <laughs> so you can relax a little bit. You know, words are interesting. In fact, there are people who actually enjoy studying words. They're known as wordsmiths, and to their delight, every year, new words are added to the dictionary. Let me ask you, when you see a new word, do you ever try and figure out its meaning? Do you? I try to do that. At the top of your page, there's a word that was added to last year's dictionary. It's abandonware. Now, if you were to try to figure out its meaning, you would break the word down into the various parts of the word. The first part is abandon. Well, we understand that means to stop something. The next part of the word is wear. Now, if you're from my generation, you know, back during the Renaissance days, <laughs> you would think of cookware. So you may come to the conclusion that abandoned wear ha has something to do with finally getting rid of all of those old dishes your grandma gave you years ago. And, and that wouldn't be correct. Actually, abandoned wear, because it was added to last year's dictionary, has to do with software. It's in reference to software that's no longer sold by its creator. Now, I said all of this to say, you know, sometimes we come across a word and we think we understand it. We think we know what it means, but in all actuality, we haven't really a clue. And today's S word is one of those words that, well, we assume we understand it. But for some reason, this S word, well, it scares us. It just causes us to be afraid. And so I want you to ask you to approach today's S word perhaps as though you've never heard it a lot like the word abandonware. I want you to set aside whatever it is that you've thought about this word, and I want you to hear it again for the first time. Kellogg's came out with a commercial a few years back in hopes to persuade adults to return to eating their cornflakes like they did when they were children. 
the advertisement simply said, Kellogg's Corn Flakes, taste them again for the first time. And today I want you to taste or learn again for the first time our S word, submission. Submission. Now when you heard the word, did you quickly mutter under your breath, oh great. Here comes a list of all the things that we have to do for our husbands just because he says we have to do them. You know, you might think of submission as being a bit antiquated. Surely it's just an old-fashioned concept. I mean, it was good for our grandma, wasn't it? But, you know, like your understanding of abandonware, you may be ready to abandon the submission thing too. And let me say, if you cringe or you automatically have negative feelings when you hear the word submission, there's some reasons for that. Maybe because of past experiences. Or maybe because you've watched others in their misery. One lady sitting in this very room who said, you know, submission. Well, I understand that. It means I have to do whatever my husband wants me to do as long as I agree with it. <laughs> Let me see if I can help you unpack what this submission means towards us. There on the paper is a definition. Simply, submission is to acknowledge or to recognize positional authority. We have no problem with that. Surely somebody has to be ahead, somebody has to be in charge. It's the next part of the definition that usually causes us problems. To rank or place under. You know, in our feminist-run society, the act of submission causes a lot of problems. There's a lot of people who just don't like it. Perhaps you remember when Kate Middleton married Prince William, you know, the royal wedding. Well, she didn't like the idea of being under submission either. In fact, she adamantly opposed, I will not say the word obey in my wedding vows. And you know, there are many women who had that very same idea. I'm not going to be under men. There's no way. I mean, especially when it comes to the, the fact that, you know, you're, you're taken advantage of or that, you know, it's some type of a weakness to be put under a man. But the submission I want you to hear today has nothing to do with weakness or unfair treatment or even the act of being put under all men, but rather the, to being obedient to the Scripture. And I'm sure a very familiar... Scripture to all of us concerning submission is found in Ephesians 5.22, where Scripture says, wives, submit. Now, before I get into this verse, I want us to understand that no verse stands alone. They all work together. They all intertwine to, to have the whole picture, the whole concept together. And so reading this verse stand, standing alone, wives, submit, well, actually, it sounds like an ultimatum. Do it or die. And that's not what Scripture is talking about. One of the uh, commentaries that I read said that just to throw this verse out haphazardly causes rebellion, and it causes a lot of resentfulness, and you would agree with that. No one wants to be looked at and said, hey, do this or die. But the study of Ephesians, if we study that whole section in Ephesians 5, there are two words that dominate that, that section. The first is submission, and the second is love. The apostle, when he was writing this, he stated many times how the husband was to love his wife as Christ loved the church. And then he did say, wives, you need to submit. And he concluded this section by saying wives are to be in reverence to their husbands. But you know, many people have come to the assumption that that submit means you do it to every man. And that's not what scripture says. I love what one pastor said, one seminary pastor said. He said, when the Bible tells women to submit to their own husbands, it is effectively telling them, now get this, I really like this. When the Bible tells a woman to submit, it's effectively telling them to refuse to submit to other men around them. That is to not give their hearts and their lives away to men who are not worthy of their affection. You see, if we finish that verse, it says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. 
So let me read that again. When the Bible tells a woman to submit to their husbands, it's effectively telling them to refuse to submit to other men around them. That is to not give their hearts and their lives away to men who are not worthy of their affections. So the assumption that women should be under submission under all men, it's not scriptural. Now that doesn't mean that I don't submit to something that Dr. Sexton would have me do or, or any other man for that matter, but there is a different submission between myself and my husband. So when the Bible tells us to submit, it's not that we submit to all men, that's not scriptural. However, when in reference to her husband, it's not optional either. Now, I realize this is a touchy so so topic, primarily, like I said, because of past experiences. There's probably not one of us in here that have not had some kind of touchy situation, either directly or we've watched somebody else with this. You know, sometimes we pick and choose what we want to do. And with this submission concept, well, sometimes we choose to because it's easy. Things are going good between our husbands and us, and it's not hard. No problem to submit. But then there are other days, well, perhaps it's just not for us that day. You know, he crossed the line. He's expecting too much, and we're probably ready to abandon it. And you know, God knew that there would be many of us who would question this plan for submission. And so he made sure that many times in his scripture that he spoke about it. The Apostle Paul talked about it not only in Ephesians, but he dealt with it in Colossians and in 1 Corinthians and in Titus. And you know, if that wasn't enough, he even had Peter address it in his book. And so even though we live in a different society than in biblical days, the act of submission to our husband is not antiquated, it's not an old-fashioned concept, and it's not just a good suggestion. There are reasons and purposes for the plan of submission. And to understand those purposes, we need to go back to the beginning, to the very beginning, back in Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve. As you well know, they were created in his own image. Interestingly, though, Adam was created first. Do you realize that automatically gave him the position of headship? Just by the nature, he was the only one created. He was the first. And then Eve was created secondly. And that gave her a subordinate position, that ranking under position. Now, notice, I said subordinate, not subservient. But as you well know, no matter what position they came in, Satan persuaded them to change their roles. When Satan tempted Eve, she stepped out of that subordinate position, that ranking under position, and she took the place of leadership. And as a result, we know that she offered the forbidden fruit to her husband, and the temptation hit Adam right in the emotions. He was no longer leading, as he should have been, but he was emotionally following her. And sin came into the picture. Adam and Eve rejected the fact that they were created in God's image in the order that they were created, and they used their freedoms to defy God. And their defiant disobedience caused God to punish them. And this brings us up to date to where submission comes into play for the couple. You see, the consequences that God gave began with Eve. If you look in Genesis, you don't have to turn there. If you looked in Genesis chapter 3, God went to Eve and he said, Eve, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And then he went on to say, And Eve, thy desire shall be to thy husband. Thy desire shall be to thy husband. Now as a young woman, I used to read that verse and I would think, thy desire shall be to thy husband. Well, sure, of course. I mean, holy cow, I waited all my life to get married. Of course I would desire that man. I mean, you've seen my husband. How could I not desire him? I mean, of course I desire that gorgeous, 
fun-loving, intelligent hunk of a man. Of course I would desire him. I mean, I would desire to love and, and be with him. And I would, of course I would desire him. But you know what? Once again, my limited understanding of certain words failed me. Because the desire spoken of in Genesis was the antithesis of what I understood it to mean. The desire God talked about meant that woman would usurp her husband's authority. That word usurp means to take over, to no longer rank under, to try to control. And that's exactly what Eve did. She took the leadership and there were problems. When God was saying here, what God was saying here was that now that sin was present, that Eve would continually step out of her role of being subordinate to her husband. She would step away from being Adam's helper, and she would attempt to control and to usurp the authority over her husband. You know, God <coughs> warned us that we would have a problem with submission. So on your blank there, why must we submit? Well, number one, it's a product of sin. You know, we are instructed by God to submit because of sin caused the need for an authority structure. In, in a perfect world, an, an authority structure wouldn't be needed because the husband and the wife and the children, they would all do the right things and the best things all the time. But we don't live in a perfect world. And so therefore, God says, I have to have a plan for submitting. We also submit not only because it's a product of sin, but number two, because it provides order in our marriage and in our homes. As with any institution, there has to be a leader. There has to be a director. And for our home and our marriages, God has designed that the husband be that leader, be that ruler. If you finish the verse in Genesis chapter 3, it says, And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Men like that verse. <laughs> Most of them won't boldly proclaim, oh yeah, I'm over that little woman and she'd better not forget it. But they like being in charge. You know, some men go to great extremes to be in command. One man felt the need to show his wife that he was the master of her home. So he began to research and find ways to prove that. His research took him to the local library where he approached the desk and he said, Excuse me, ma'am, could you tell me where I would find the book, Man, Master of Women? And the woman, without even looking up, said, Well, sir, if we have it, it would be in the fiction section. <laughs> You know, God designed for there to be order in the marriage, and so he chose man to lead it. In 1 Corinthians 11, Scripture tells us, But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. Now, I realize in our homes, we oversee a lot. We are in control of a lot of things, and I have little doubt how our what homes would be without us. I mean, my own husband has said numerous times that he would be a disaster without me. And I could not agree more. <laughs> Why, I'm sure my husband would not only be lonely without me, but he'd be starving and probably naked too. <laughs> you know, it's natural for us to take charge, to oversee things in our home. I mean, after all, we're there every day. We cook, we clean, we tend to the kids and the husbands, and we pay the bills, we read the mail, we shop, we taxi, we make the appointments, we're busy, we make things happen. But ladies, if we are not careful, we will cross over a boundary and attempt, and attempt to lead every aspect of our homes and our marriages. I want you to understand, understand there is a difference in running a household and ruling one. God has placed our husbands to lead us, and we need to seek our husbands' advice and help in the home. Now, you may be thinking, okay, 
You don't know my husband. And ladies, it may be true. Your husband may not lead the way you would lead. He may not do things the way that you would do them. You may not agree with how he handles situations or what decisions that he makes. But if you want biblical order in your home, you must do things God's way. And God says that man leads the marriage. You know, ladies, in our home, order doesn't come when a wife constantly criticizes her husband's leadership. And order doesn't come when she regularly points out his errors or his insufficiencies. God does not instruct us to submit to our home, uh, to our husbands, when it comes to his character. We're not to submit based on whether or not he's successful or whether he has the right abilities or whether he has the best character or whether he does things our way. God put our husbands as the ruler of the home, and he says we need to submit. And so the next time you grab, you decide to grab the reins and be in control and in head of your home and your marriage, let me remind you, anything with two heads is a monster. So why do we submit? It's a product of sin, and it provides order in the home. Now, here's the good part. Number three, there's power in submitting. As I explained earlier, often we think we understand the meaning of words only to learn just how wrong we were. And one of the biggest misconceptions is that we presume being submissive is always having to give up, having to give in, or worse, always losing. We tend to think, oh, if I submit to this man, then I lose my freedom. I lose my friendships. I lose my joy and my pleasures. And worst of all, I never have a right to say anything. And ladies, if that's your view of submission, then you cannot possibly understand the power of it. You see, the greatest verse on submission is not found in Ephesians or any of the other ones that Paul and Peter wrote. However, the greatest verse on submission is found in Luke 22:42, 42, where it says, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I heard a pastor say once, the greatest hero this world has ever known is the greatest submitter, the great submitter. Christ, in his greatest heroic accomplishment, submitted to the Father. He didn't lose His obedient submission brought us the greatest victory of all. Ladies, our very pattern for submission is the Savior, the great submitter, where Scripture says, who for the joy set before him obeyed the Father, submitted to the Father all the way to death so that we wouldn't have to die that death. We need to understand we submit not ultimately to man, to our husbands, but to the God-man. We submit to the very one who mastered submission on our behalf. In viewing submission as Christ did, then we'll have the understanding that biblical submission is not giving up. It's not losing. It's not being blocked from ever having anything to say, never being able to oversee anything, never being able to do anything. But rather, biblical submission is accepting and recognizing your husband's authority and then working together with your husband to help him be a good leader. When we follow Christ's pattern of submission, we will find so many powerful results in our marriage. One of the first powerful results that we'll find in our marriage is when is that it will be a product, it will produce peace and harmony. Peace and harmony. Do you realize that when the wife accepts and allows her husband to be the leader of the marriage, that the couple will find that there's a better spirit in the home? Better? Because, well, there's not bickering and fighting and carrying on. You see, if there's not fighting and bucking each other, then there's going to be peace and harmony in the home. 
There will be times when it's more challenging to submit to your husband than at other times. That's because of our sin nature. But no matter what difficulty you face, when you submit, you don't lose. You gain peace and harmony in your home. And another powerful result of submission is that it will polish the relationship. Not only is there more peace and harmony in the home when the wife permits her husband to lead and she chooses to to follow, there will also be relational benefits. One of those relational benefits is that you'll find you'll grow closer to each other. You see, if there are fewer bouts of discord, then you'll actually want to be together. Do you have trouble being with your husband? Hmm. There's a reason. And when you're together, then you will be closer to one another. Don't you want to be closer to your sweetheart? Don't you want to enjoy being together? So we need to stop bucking him. Stop bickering and fighting and carrying it on and going against him. Another result in the relationship will be that you'll have freedom to actually enjoy one another. As you grow closer together, you'll find that you're not walking on eggshells. That's a nice feeling. You're not walking around miffed at your husband. You can actually let your hair down and relax a little bit because you're not at odds with each other. And you can start having fun together. When was the last time you had fun with your sweetheart? That's scary. And you know what? Part of the fun is our next point. Another benefit is there's greater romance. When you're enjoying one another, the delight of physical intimacy is sure to follow. So I guess you could say submission's good for your sex life. I did work that S word in there. (laughs) How is your romantic life? It is ultimately a result of how you submit to your husband. It is. It's an important part. And also, number four, you'll find that there's an increased feeling of love and grace for one another. You know, if you're not fussing about who's the boss, where you get to go to the restaurant to eat, how you spend your money, ways you rear your children, or sexual expectations, then you will begin to feel a greater love from and towards one another. And when the love is greater, it will be a lot easier to extend grace when it is needed. And don't we need to be extended grace from time to time? Yes. And a final powerful result of submission is it provides a protective barrier for your marriage. Provides a protective barrier. Because the relationship is deeper for the couple where the husband is leading as Christ instructs and the wife is following him, submitting to that. The atmosphere of your home is more inviting. And the reason for that is because there's a bond of trust and respect. And when that happens, it produces a fortress around your marriage. You see, ladies, your sweet submission can be quite alluringly powerful to your husband. Your submissiveness helps build a bonding wall around your marriage. One brick at a time, the layers are made. Each layer strengthens your union. Each brick helps to fortify a loving commitment between one another. Each layer shows the husband that he can trust his wife and that he can know that she'll be a helper to him and she'll be a supporter to him. And she'll work with him and not against him. And the, hus- and the wife can have confidence that the mate will choose what's best for her family. He won't be a tyrant. And he'll truly care for her. Because the marriage is protected and the relationship is sweeter and stronger, another benefit of this bonding wall is that it helps to protect against infidelity in the marriage. And that in of itself is so vital. 
Your submissiveness also is a protective me measure to help your mate follow Christ. I realize there's a real struggle to submit and to respect a man who's not living right who's not following Christ as he ought, who's mean and unkind, selfish, ungodly. But Peter reminds us it's through a meek and quiet spirit without a word. And I'm going to add without usurping authority that that man can be won by a right lifestyle. Peter says at reverence, respecting him. And that's a protective measure for your marriage. You know, ladies, when we den deny the urge to resent and to retaliate against our husbands, we're helping to build a protective barrier right around our marriage. You say, okay, I hear you. What you're saying sounds right, but... And we've all been there. But what do you do? when you disagree with your husband's decisions? What do you do when he's going in a different direction than you're going? To answer that, let me quote one of the authors that I read. She said, the only time submission really becomes an issue between a husband and a wife, the only time it becomes an issue is when they don't agree on something. Go figure. You know, as long as we're all on the same page, Agreeing, there's no reason for anyone to submit to anything or anyone. It's only when the two of you realize that you're not on the same page or perhaps not even in the same book that there's a problem and that submission is put to the test. You know, we all know submission's not a walk in the park. It requires daily dying of ourselves and our desires and because we're selfish people, hmm, that is not easy. It requires tremendous strength, strength that doesn't come from ourselves. The truth of it is, ladies, you cannot submit to your husband any more than your husband can love you like Christ. Love the church. Well, that is, you can't do it on your own. We all need the supernatural work of the one who fully understands and who perfectly submitted. God doesn't command us things that are easy. If he did, then anyone could master it, and we really wouldn't need God. Instead, he commands a level of living that's impossible because of our sin nature. But it's the biblical pattern of submission that's done not in our own strength, but in the strength of the Lord. Have you ever prayed and said, God, I need your help to submit to this man? I need your help to follow him? Submission is not ultimately about us. It's not about our husbands. And it's not about our own little corner of marital bliss. It's about God. And it's about the story we tell with our lives. So when we submit... To our mates, we're telling the watching world, even if that world is just the little ones in your home, you're telling them what you believe about God and his work in your life. So no matter what your test may be, when it comes to submission, there's a few things you can know, you can be sure of. First of all, biblical submission is a heart attitude. If you struggle being a submissive wife, take a look at your heart. Scripture says, as a man thinketh, in his heart, so is he. So when you find you don't agree, you don't like, you resent whatever direction your husband's taking you and your family, check your heart. Be sure you're in line with the Word of God. And also be sure you're not just being selfish and stubborn in some way. So submission is an attitude of the heart. And number two, it requires that you be teachable and responsive. Are you? Are you teachable and responsive? This may mean that you learn to step out of your comfort zone. It may mean doing things that you never dreamed of doing, or doing things differently from how you're accustomed. Or it may mean doing things you just don't want to do. There'll be times when your husband must 
have your help. Whether it's something simple as cleaning up after a storm or wiping up water from a pipe breakage or maybe something even larger such as molding the hearts of your children or making a move to another city or changing a job. Are you teachable and willing to submit? Do you help him? You married the man. Do you trust him? How do you respond when he asks for your help? How do you react when he asks you to do something that crimps your style? To be teachable and responsive requires that you be willing to yield yourself to your husband rather than resisting him all the time. Remember, you're a team. You work together. Teams work together. Scripture says, and the two shall become one. And you do realize there are so many areas in your husband's life that one person needs help. Because the burden is great, or the job is overwhelming, or the heart is just heavy. Submission means we be teachable and responsive, even when you don't understand, and especially when you don't like your mate's plans. There's a few things that submission's not. First of all, I'm going to run through these fast, but submission does not mean that you are a doormat. When Adam saw Eve for the first time, he did not praise God for giving him a servant, a doormat. God, he said, oh dear God, thank you for giving me flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. He was delighted in her. You're not your husband's doormat. You are his sweetheart. You are his love and his wife. How can a man trust and for that matter delight in a doormat? He can't. He loves you. Number two, submission does not mean that you are inferior to your husband. Just because God ordained man to rule or lead the wife does not mean that he's any better or more gifted than the wife. You are made in the image of God. You're not inferior. Number three, submission does not mean that you are condemned into mindlessness. Mindlessness. You are not doomed to a blind fate of unquestioning obedience. You're smart. You think clearly. You have valid opinions. And you do have a right to express those opinions in the right way, of course. Being submissive does not mean you leave your brain in the bed when you get up in the morning. It doesn't mean that you never have a right to help your mate, to bring to his attention the things perhaps that he doesn't see or understand. You're not mindless. Number four, submission does not mean that your husband is always right. <laughs> but you already knew that. <laughs> Your husband's not God, and like you, he's a sinner, and therefore he's not always right. So, um, what about the times when submitting feels like anything but a joy and a privilege? And what do you do when he asks you to follow and trust him when you want to do exactly the opposite? What happens when you and your husband have talked and talked and talked through an issue and you seem to have come to an impasse and you don't know where to go from here? You want one thing, he wants another. What? What do you do? We well, need to understand. We all live within parameters. Parameters of scriptural principles and our own preferences. Ladies, if Scripture has spoken on an issue, then we must pay attention. However, there are some areas, some gray areas, that are subject to preference. Many situations that come in a marriage may not have a scriptural right or wrong answer. And so it's important to share your preferences. But in the end, you need to remember God works through our husbands for the good of our whole family. And our husbands will answer to God for his choices. So, if he doesn't always make the right decision, 
because he isn't always right. You need to leave that in the hands of God. And number five, submission never requires you to follow your husband into sin. Submission does not mean condoning and copying the sin in our husband's lives. Your ultimate allegiance and loyalty belongs to Christ. And if your husband abuses his God-given authority and requires you to do something that's not in tune with the scriptures, you must obey God first. You see, a wife does not get a pass for doing wrong just because her husband requires him to follow her. And number six, submission does not mean you are abused. Tragically, some women feel submission means to be under domestic abuse, to feel weak and worthless, to be berated and bullied, to be vulnerable to angry, controlling men. And this is not biblical submission. There is no justification for a husband to abuse his wife, whether it be overtly physical or verbal. It's never right. And let me say, if you are experiencing such abuse, get help. Go to the necessary extremes, I did say extremes, to get freedom from such abuse. First and foremost, protect yourself and your children. You see, in a situation such as this, submission is not the problem. The husband's sin is the problem. So submission does not mean that you suffer any kind of domestic abuse. In closing, let me say, you do realize all of us will submit. We will either submit to our husbands as God has designed, or we'll submit to our own flesh, and we'll choose to be our own authority, our own boss. God said that we would desire our husbands. And when he said that, In essence, it was a warning to us. You know, warnings are meant for one purpose, to help us, to alert us. Our actual act of submission is what we do with God's warning. And ladies, I pray that we will heed God's warning and we will willingly proclaim, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Ladies, don't fear or run from submission. Embrace its power. Embrace having peace and harmony in your home again. Embrace becoming closer to your sweetheart by surrendering and following him. Experience greater love and enjoyment. Don't run from submission. Submission begins first when we choose to be obedient to the scripture, God's plan. And it continues when we willingly support our mate. A pastor said once, Submission is a divine calling. It's from God. Submission is a divine calling of a wife to honor and affirm her husband's leadership and to help carry it through according to her gift. According to her gift, You realize we are a gift to our husbands? Scripture said, he who finds a wife findeth a good thing. Are you a good gift? I encourage you when you go home, present yourself to your husband as a gift. In your gift, what package, what will you put in your package? I think your package needs to include so many important things, obviously, Your first package, your first thing needs to be love. Put lots and lots of love in your package. Let him know that you would do anything for him. You see, it was love that brought you together. It's love that will help you submit. Love your husband. Also, in your gift that you give to your husband, give him respect. This is showing that reverence and that honor that Peter talked about. Respect him. Avoid cutting down your man. Stop being so negative. Lift him up and praise him. Encourage him for being a good leader. Do you realize that they respond to what they receive? 
And next, add to your package, we'll add some lingerie because it's needed. <laughs> Keep the spice in your marriage. Yes, I'm back to that S word again. Ladies, don't use your body as a weapon against your husband. Give yourself freely to him. Keep your intimacy alive and hot in your marriage. Also in your gift, add some long-suffering. Put some long-suffering in there. You know, you won't always agree with him. It won't always be a joy to submit to him because you know he's not always right. You know he's messed up. <laughs> it's then that long-suffering is going to be even more needed. That's that showing grace. Because one day you're going to need that grace. In your gift also include a whole bunch of gentleness and kindness. No one wants to be around a grumpy, cantankerous woman. Are you that way? Be kind. Be gentle. You'll find you reap what you sow. And also for good measure... Go ahead and add some more sexual pleasures to him. <laughs> You're with your husband this weekend. Don't let that pass. Let him know that you really love him. And, you know, the way to a man's heart, well, we all know, food. Let's give him lots of sweets, lots of treats, lots of good things. Load him up on all the good things that you have for him. He needs that. Maybe he'll share it with you. <laughs> and at the very top of all of those gifts, ladies, I encourage you, add the biggest and the most valuable treasure of all, the treasure of submission. Follow the great submitter. Freely choose to support and obey and follow your husband. Be teachable. Be responsive. And you know, as you learn to submit, you'll find that you and your husband will experience a rich and joy-filled marriage. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for such a simple lesson, but such a hard one for us to do. When we are weak, we run to you for strength. When we're confused and we don't understand, help us to seek you for our understanding and just to trust our mates. Thank you for our husbands. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for dying and being the great submitter for us. In Christ's name.